ready? It's the Roundtable with me, Robert Bannon. Welcome to the Roundtable, everybody. My name is Robert Bannon. You're listening to us on the Broadway Podcast Network, or you're watching us as the phone rings in the background, because that's how life is in New Jersey. Time has stood still. There's still a landline here in this house. Well, so welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to have you here. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I was teaching in the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and my, my musical theater students were talking about how to audition. And we brought in Clea Blackhurst, who, when I saw her in the hallway, I was like, I know you, I love you, and Jim, and Billy, and everything you do at Birdland, and you have the best Ethel Merman in the world, and you put on, you are a legendary cabaret singer and theater person, and my students are so lucky to have you. And then Clea's coming to Chelsea Table and Stage and at the show coming autumn in New York, Vernon Duke's Broadway, April 14th at seven o'clock. And you need to get your tickets because Chelsea Table and Stage, you can get a little appetizer and a glass of wine and you go to the rooftop afterwards. And she's going to literally walk right past you when she enters the stage. Clea Blackhurst is here and I'm so excited. Welcome to the round table. Thank you very much. It's so great to be here. It's great to see you. Oh my gosh. I am so excited to see you. I first saw you, at, speaking of Birdland, I saw you right after the pandemic happened. Susie Mosher did oh. her, was back, and the, her lineup was upstairs the first few weeks. And you kicked off one of them that I was at. And Clea, you just are like this world of musical theater and show and kept, that's it right there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love, I mean, that whole era of like show business that's, your heart may be breaking, but what you show is something very happy and cheerful. I, I have the puppy so he doesn't make a fool of us. So no, okay. mine is around the corner as well. So <laughs> yeah, hi, puppy. Him, he'll be like an annoyance very quickly. Um, but anyway, this mod, this, you know, people are like, why do I want to like pay attention to this older stuff? Why should I go see a show about Ethel Merman or Vernon Duke or anybody else? I tell one reason because I'm doing it. In, yeah. in other words, not that it's me, but that somebody alive today is standing in front of you, caring about it. Comes, to, it, it may be something that you'll fall in love with because there's so much to fall in love with. Well, absolutely, and and like I said, like it's such a great place to see a show. It's such an intimate place to see a show, and you can be there at ChelseaTableAndStage.com and get a ticket. Now, what what I'm loving, I mean, I think I think you know this, but just to make it like super clear, is um, okay. I'm gonna put him down, and if no, he makes it's noise, not, we're gonna, okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's it's I'm doing something called the box set. So this is like Chelsea Table and Stage has let me come there and have this be the space. My producer Denise Cooper is working with them, and so we're there monthly, but every month is a different show. So uh, this is the first one. This is the Vernon Duke show, which has not been seen in New York in 20 years. So, and this got, this was great. And then the next one will be the Jerry Herman one I do. That happens in May. And then Billy and I come and do ours. And then the Ethel Merman one is back in November. So it's a, it's kind of an ongoing, exciting thing for me because it's revisiting you know, my shows kind of want to grow up and play theaters. They don't know that they're like in small rooms. So they are fully scripted. They have scores. They have orchestrations. They have things that are like, you can pull it down off the shelf. And the fact that, for example, that this Vernon Duke one hasn't been, it, there's a great album of it that I get compliments on still. You know, it's a really cool album with string. It, it's really great. Um, but it hasn't been fully, you know, put back up and have me do all the, the patter and all the stuff in between, which is really a fascinating career. If people think they don't know Vernon Duke, they're wrong. Because if you know Autumn in New York, the song, if you know April in Paris, beautiful. if you know Taking a Chance on Love, I Can't Get Started, these, these are contributions he made. But the interesting thing for me, Robert, is that they were all nestled in gigantic Broadway flops. So you don't think of Autumn in New York as being a show tune. No, it's or a show tune, you know? So that's fun. I love I love that part of it. That's like, I love putting things in context. I think it makes them more interesting to listen to. And you get like this investment, like, wait, Autumn in New York is a show tune? And it was a flop? Yes, it was. Thumbs up was a big flop. So um, <laughs> anyway, that's kind of what's going on in a nutshell. 
but the song lives forever. And then to hear you do it and, and do it there in, in Chelsea. Wait, you have these shows. That's what I was going to say to you. You have these shows. You have a bunch. Of, there's a couple of shows that you have, a bunch of shows that you do around the country. And, and you 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 get to play. You have them ready to go. Because I was going to say to you, Clea, that's a lot of music to learn. And a lot of song lyrics and a lot of pattern. Do you? Well, here's how it goes. Ethel Mer the Everything the Traffic Will Allow, which was the one about Ethel Merman. That was, um, that came out in 2001. Now that one gets booked a lot because no matter what I say and do, people are like, yeah, but can you bring the one about Ethel Merman? Yes. Uh, and then the Vernon Duke was the second one, which was a very big departure from Ethel Merman, this woman who only had hits and that I had an affinity for vocally to my next passion to be this guy who only had Broadway flops that you don't think of me singing Autumn in New York. I didn't think of me singing Autumn in New York, but I absolutely fell in love with him and his story. And so that kind of defined that. Then I have one about Jerry Herman, who became a friend of mine. And, you know, Billy Scritch and I have a Hoagie Carmichael show. So these are shows that, yes, have been around for quite a while um, in one form or another. Hey, I'm going to plug my computer in because, you know, what I don't want to do is lose contact with you. No, okay? Geez. It's real. Here we go. Boom, we're, here, boom, we're real. Boom. It's real. It's real. There we are. So anyway, so yeah, it is. I mean, I had a, there was a part of me that wanted to do these originally, like, I wanted to do one weekend where each day was a different show. And I was like, well, first of all, nobody's going to come every day. And second of all, why would I do that to myself? So yeah. even though I know these songs, why I would set out to like make my life extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult is a really good question. But once I found, um, you know, once I kind of landed on the idea of once a month, they are hard to get back up and in your head. I think hopefully this series the box set will roll in because it's got cute graphics now and everything. And you can go to cleablackhurst.com and see them or go to, um, there it is. That should all be up brand new today. Um, and, so, and now the tickets are all on sale at Chelsea Table and Stage. So if you really want to see the Ethel Merman one, which I shouldn't be selling right now because I need you to come Sunday and see yep. the Vernon. But you can buy any of these shows now. Uh, if you have your life together enough, but Sunday is, is what I really want people to know and believe that whether they think they know Vernon Duke or not, they're going to, they're going to love it. It's a great show. I'm really proud of it. And it's your voice. And that's what we want to hear. And we want to hear your voice and we want to hear these songs that we know and love. And we can buy, you can buy them every month. It's like perfect date to put on your calendar. And it is. They're all on a Sunday night at seven. You know, it's not the same Sunday. And, and uh, I have a couple fun theater things coming up. So we won't do we won't do the summer, but we'll be back in the fall. So okay. coming up now, we have Vernon Duke on Sunday. And then we have uh, Jerry Herman, which is in May. And you just kind of look ahead. It's a Sunday night at seven. It's like you go over there, have your, like you said, it's like, it's a nice space. I love it because the ceilings are high. Now, yes. I feel like I do well in a room with high ceilings. <laughs> that's, like, that's what I'm most excited about. And good food. And, you know, it's a it's a fun it, it, it's a fun night out. It has like a good vibe for me. It, it does. I, I, I love seeing shows there. I love doing I did my Christmas show there and it has good energy. The energy yeah. is good. I think you're right up on the stage. And yeah. I think that people feel like you're a part of it. It's very intimate and very fun place to do a show. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I like it. We we know you from theater. We know you from your recorded music, your albums that people can stream your music wherever music is heard now. Where you know we live in the the age of the it's crazy, isn't it? Crazy and, <laughs> and 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 of course the Ethel Merman Show award winning and, and done. But you have done a lot of musical theater. You've worked with some of. I mean, we had Rupert Holmes just here the other day, wow. and he talked a little bit about Nutty Professor. You worked with Marvin Hamlish. We talk about Billy Stritch. We talk about you know really big. How do you, how did you departmentalize your career. You do master classes, you coach, you do concerts, you do musical theater. Has it always been whatever comes your way? Is it, is it, is it dip, the summer is for theater and the fall is for, how do you do it? Well, I think it's, you know, I, I hope I say this to myself, not for other people, but I'm saying to myself, I hope it's an inspirational tale of, you know, I moved to New York a million years ago to be in Broadway shows. That's all I cared about, Broadway musicals. I love them with such a great passion. 
Well, I just, it was not my time. I mean, my skill set was not lining up with what the world was, and it was not lining up with my perception of myself, with what people needed, and so on. So before I gave it all up and went a whole different direction with my life, I wrote this show about Ethel Merman. Now, to be clear for anybody who doesn't know me, it's, it's, I don't play her. It's not that. I take her Broadway career and I pick a song from each one of her shows and tell stories about her and so on. And that show really got my foot in the door. It's a Broadway thing, right? Because it's Ethel Merman. And so people think I have this association with Broadway that I made up. And that's a really powerful thing because you don't, to be an expert on something, you don't have to know more than anybody in the world. You just have to really know what you know. And so that's kind of what I set out to do. I'm just a geeky, I love that stuff. Facts, figures, all that kind of stuff. Plus, I love performing and singing. So they kind of came together and that became what I did. So that started like a kind of a a, a concert. You know, Jerry Herman saw me do something and loved me. So started asking me to sing with symphonies on his music. So suddenly I'm at the Palladium in London with Angela Lansbury singing. You know, so it's a very... If I could tell anybody how to do it, I would have no idea. There's no way to do it. So, but I never gave up and never have given up on like a Broadway show and a Broadway career. And so, you know, it's funny with Rupert, I got involved with The Nutty Professor, which was Marvin Hamlish's last score with Rupert Holmes. Brilliant. I, I love Rupert so much. Um, I got involved with that years and years before Rupert and, and uh, Marvin did. I was the first person other than uh, Michael Andrew who had come to Jerry Her uh, Jerry uh, Lewis with the idea of making the Nutty Professor. He got my CD into Jerry Lewis's hands. Jerry Lewis listened to it, called me, asked me to fly to Las Vegas to ask me if I would be in his Broadway version of the Nutty Professor. I was like, sure. There was no show, Robert. There was no score. There was nobody involved. I'm like, I'm the closest thing to Broadway the show has and there's no show. And he's like, if I do it in six months, do you want to, I want to know that you're on board. This is Jerry Lewis sitting across his, I'm like, yeah, I'm on board. There's nothing to not be on board with. Right. You, so you, you flew to Vegas to see Jerry. Were you like at an Italian restaurant in a corner booth somewhere? Like, where do you, well, where do you, I went, I went to Jerry Lewis films in, in incorporate, whatever. It, it, I got a call one day from this woman. She said, hello, this is, this is Penny with Jerry Lewis uh, in Jerry Lewis's office. Mr. Lewis likes, would like to know if there's a time you'll be in Las Vegas. I've never told this, by the way. This is fine. A time you'll be in Las Vegas that Mr. Lewis would like to meet with you. And I'm like, Lu Mr. Jerry Lewis who? Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> and I was in Los Angeles at the time. I rented a car so fast and drove to Las Vegas because I was like, what? I, I mean, it was just a mystery. So I drove there. As soon as he got me settled, set down with a... He got me a Diet Coke, whatever I want, across his desk. And he's like, you know, he's like chewing on it. You know, he's got it. Uh -huh, and he said, he asked me first if I knew who Kathleen Freeman was. And she played Miss Lemon in the movie of The Nutty Professor. And she had the great career. She was like, right before she died, she did the original cast of The Full Monty on Broadway and so on. And I said, I do. I love Kathleen Freeman. He said, I knew you would. You're an old soul. And he felt that I was a 21st century version of Kathleen Freeman, and he wanted me to play that part. So I've been involved with The Nutty Professor the better part of my entire adult life, kind of, you know. Um, so those kind of adventures happen to me. Uh, strange, just things that you can't really, I, I can't explain. And he did direct the first production we did in Nashville in 2012 when Marvin died. Marvin died while we were we had just opened it and Marvin passed away. And uh, what a loss because Hamlish and Holmes were just getting started, man. They were a good team. Yeah. So anyway, so no, I don't compartmentalize it. When I get an offer, you know, I've done a be two beautiful productions of Gypsy. I did a lot of Anything Goes during the Reno Sweeney years and so on. And it's always my thing. They all kind of roll around together. If you want to pay me to do a Tide commercial, I'm in, you know. Like whatever it is, I have no, I just want to like do, this is what I do. This is what I have to offer the world, which is just a continuing, ever evolving version of myself, you know? And if, and if it can be used, it's up, it's, it's, I'm offering it, you know?
Well, we love it. And we, we like we said, we keep going. Go to cleablackhurst.com, go to the website, and then get your tickets to see the show Sunday the 14th at Chelsea Table and Stage.com and all of the shows throughout the month. You, Cabaret, I learned for me, as someone who also loved musical theater and, and wanted to go to school for musical theater, at some point, I let it go because I wasn't enjoying, like, I love the cabaret space. I love the concert space because it's intimate. It's personal. I don't have to deal with blocking. I don't have to deal with your direction. <laughs> I, I would do musical theater and people would say, well, the melody line, well, I'm singing a melody. Isn't that good enough? You know, I say to people, when they try to teach me a harmony, I'm like, just tell me it's the melody and I'll learn it. I don't care what you call it. It's my melody. Go. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I get it. Um, what do you love as someone who is, in my opinion, a master of, of the space, of putting together, building a show, a cabaret and, and making a through line? It's a lot harder than people think to do a good cabaret show. What, what, what is the key? What, how do you work on it? Is it, do you put songs together? Do you put the story first? What is your process? I, well, my, I am doing one that's a, an evening with Clea Blackhurst. I'm gonna do that in October, which is for me, themeless. You know, that's like a big departure for me because I like to get inside the, uh, you know, the Ethel Merman one. I love the Vernon Duke. It's like, I love researching these things. Research is my favorite. I just love it. And for me, I find, like I just said a second ago, putting these songs in a context, I don't consider myself, I don't come into the world like I am this great interpreter of song. I mean, I think I'm fine at Don't I'd still buy a ticket. I'm a good interpreter. Yes. But what I really bring is like a putting a song in a context. You tell some little story or some fact about something and then go into a song that it's like, oh my gosh, I know this song. I had no idea it was from, you know, th that there was this story behind its creation or whatever. And it it's an investment in it. And then you just give your, really give your, focus and attention and all to the music and the words and people can feel when the heart is genuine when a heart has to sing you know i when i teach i can always tell there are people who just need to sing and i'm one of those people you know and so putting the shows together yeah i mean the ones that are the scripted ones they're all about research and figuring out What's a good through line? I don't, um, you know, like I don't believe in strictly. And then he wrote, I don't do chronological ones. They fade in and out of like exact, you know, I yeah. mean, some they're like the early makes a lot more sense to kind of be over here. And, and you know, um, but I just, I don't know. I just let my, I just let my wits kind of guide me with that. And, uh, and I was working with Mark Waldrop uh, on my most recent one, which was uh, much of it over the pandemic. Uh, everybody got created then, didn't they? Yes. Um, uh, uh, on my Jerry Herman one, he helped kind of shape things and say, I don't think you need that whole story. And as I got more confident with myself, I said, this might be a good time for you to work with a good director to like make sure you're as interesting as you think you are, you know? The well, is is that the key? Is the is the tricky part about someone like Jerry Herman or someone like Ethel Merman? Like there are songs that we're coming in expecting to hear. We want to hear. There are some... How do you do? You, you, you put us some deep cuts and some or some things that we don't hear all the time with the what we yeah. expect to hear. I'll tell you a secret. Now, see, this is maybe dangerous because this might turn somebody off. But I, what I love about for for Jerry, for example, I mean, with Vernon Duke, you have to put in the big four. You've got to do all. You know, you've got to do taking a chance on level up. That's not hard. So you get those in, and then with 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 Vernon Duke, then you find this collection of music that you're like, wait, why did I never hear this one? Why did I get to know April in Paris? Well, it's because a whole like generation after it's written, Count Basie picks it up and makes it into this signature for his band. Or Bunny Berrigan makes I Can't Get Started into his theme song and we learn it that way. But it's not because of when they happen, right? So the songs that are just as good as those songs that never had somebody pick them up and turn them into a things theme song are legion. There's tons of them. So you'll hear these songs. It's like, wait, I should know. I don't know this. Wow. That's amazing. This is like, so that's kind of one thing. Um, but with, with somebody like Jerry Herman, for example, my goal was 
there's enough there because he's just like Mr. Showtune, right? There's enough there that you're going to get stuff that you want. But my goal was to get some really profound, wonderful things in there that you don't hear all the time and hope that by the time we get to the end, you didn't notice that I didn't do if you walked into my life. Yes. Okay. Yes. You know? So, so it's not like you're sitting waiting, but blah, blah, blah. there's so much that's going to entertain you and be interesting, but you kind of go an unexpected way. Because I think to myself, aside from the fact that I played Maine in high school when I was 17, uh, I don't, you don't need to hear me do that song. I don't have like a new something that I feel confident about. Like, you know what you need? You, I, you need my, if he walked into my life, that's not one of the, the Herman songs that like leaps out as belonging to me, to me. Right. So it, it's kind of like that, like walking a line, you know, there's some stuff. Uh, what's the one it's from um, dear world. It's called eat um, each tomorrow morning. If your world falls flat on its face today, you can erase today, tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, I guess. Um, I love it so much that I can't believe it's not one of the big, 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 big ones. So of course that had to get in there with, this and then I thought, oh, well, that goes with I'll be here tomorrow with each tomorrow morning, goes right into I am what I am. That those things are a statement about Jerry himself. You know, they just it just starts to kind of come together. And usually if I can see an end for a show and a beginning for a show, it will inform itself by working on it and thinking about it. Oh. I love that. I love that. It's my favorite part. I mean, I love performing and I know we love, we love performing, but, yes. but the playing and the tinkering and the building and the ideas, and yeah. it's very exciting. It, and it's a great, and a great collaborator. Like Michael Rice has been working with me from the very, very beginning. And he is a character and we're very complimentary, you know, like with Ethel Merman, I chose one song from each. She had 14 Broadway shows that were all considered hits from 1930 to she was the last Dolly. Dolly was written for her, but she didn't take the job. So you have 1930 to 1970 of active Broadway work. So what if you choose one song, one from each of those, oh, I got rhythm is a kind of easy choice. This is other whatever, whatever. What do you choose from Gypsy? Okay, there you have an embarrassment of riches. So if you want one, what do you do? And uh I decided, I mean, I really didn't know what to, I don't want to do Rose's turn out of context. It's too much work, blah, blah, blah. Um, which Karen Mason did recently at her show. I said, girl, you are a con, you are like a punish, a glutton for punishment. You know, you have to end Gypsy with that song. No matter what that song is at the end, she ended her show with it. It was fabulous. But I decided everything's coming up roses. However, when you do everything's coming up roses, it's out of context. It seems like this great, like da, 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 this great anthem of like life and positive. When in the show, it's the end of act one. And it's actually the most disturbing moment in the show because you realize like she slipped her tether. Like she has like lost it right now. June has run away. She's left with the not talented one. She's like, wait, no, I'm going to turn you into a star. It's very uncomfortable. And so I talked that through with Michael in trying to decide whether that was the one or not. Da, da, da. And he came back at me with like the most haunting sort of, he calls it an elegant ragtime version of that song that never fails to kind of stop the show. I mean, it's the, it's the place where I point to him and give him all the credit for it. Because what you hear in the room with me singing it is what Rose is hearing in her head when she does it. It's not the show version where you're like, y'all will be swell. It's more like, no, you'll be swell. You'll be, it's, it's really haunting and wonderful. So if you have that kind of collaborator, which I do with Michael, uh, that just makes it all the more joyous. Ooh, you got, you sold me a ticket. I, I need to <laughs> come on. It's, uh, it's, it's a really, it's a really amazing show. I, I, they all have to be, and and your your the the love and care. Love is in the details, and it's these details that make these special evenings of music. Where where were you? Where are you from? And when did you decide like this was the life for you? What was <laughs> what inspired you? Well, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and right, you don't think of that as the hotbed of American musical theater, but it is the hotbed of American musical comedy because we don't drink and we didn't smoke and we didn't swear we right. just ate sugar and watched musicals you know what i mean it was like that was our thing 
So my mom was a was a musical comedy actress. I mean, it's a famous folklore in our family that she was pregnant with me when she played Ada Lammy. So she was singing I Can't Say No while being pregnant with her first baby. Um, and she was just, a, she was a character, you know, and she, and she had that kind of big voice like Merman had and so on. And so I just grew up around that going to rehearsals, taking my little blanket, taking naps in between the theater seats during rehearsal and so on. So that's a really familiar part of my life. And we have Pioneer Theater Company there, and which is a big regional theater, um, Lort House in Salt Lake, connected to the campus. And um, I went to college there. I loved it. And I loved that theater. And I did my equity apprenticeship there and got came to New York with my equity card because of that. And it was always professional uh, um, directors and, oh, maybe four or five equity contracts per um, you know, per show. So I was meeting all these fascinating, real working professionals. Um, and I just, I always knew, I don't know why I always, I loved the cast albums. I loved them, especially Annie Get Your Gun. And then in seventh grade, I started collecting albums when I got my first babysitting job, right? I get my $30 at the end of the week and go to the mall and buy an album, then go to the library and research everything I could about that show. Um, and that just kind of fed it. And then I, I sang and said, I wanted to be a professional trumpet player. I know that's, it, it's the same as being a belter if you play in Israel, you know, but I'm just not very good. I have no embouchure. I have no, I can't last for more than like 20 minutes. And that's not for lack of trying. I wanted to be like, da, 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 da. I wanted to play the trumpet in the, in the pit of Gypsy. But I realized I just didn't have what it took. And then I realized, oh, but I can sing forever. I don't get tired singing. So I switched over to the performing and it was, a, you know, I mean, that was in high school and that was a pretty natural um, switch. I wanted to be at the same place at night. I wanted to be doing the same thing. I just switched my job. Um, and so that's, that's how I came to New York right out of college, graduated, did one more equity production where they gave me my equity card to do Hello Dolly at Pioneer Theater Company. And then I already had my ticket and everything to come to New York that uh, October and just thought, I'll give myself five years, five years, and then I can come home if I don't like it. You know, 40 years later, uh, we're still, <laughs> it's still wet. It's like five years. Oh, Salt Lake got expensive too. There's nowhere to go. I got to stay in my apartment, you know? And so, and my family's all there. And yes, I did grow up more. I was called Ethel Mormon in junior high school. So um, cause I was loud, but I, I've, uh, still got all my family and tons of, you know, connections there and I love it, but yeah, but I'm in New York way many, many more years here. As You're a New Yorker now. Right. Yeah, exactly. You are a quintessential New Yorker. At yeah. New Yorker. Yeah. Truly. That's a fascinating. I love the stories about people who, I grew up in Jersey. So I, I lived in Fort Lee, New Jersey. I'm a mile from New York. I grew up with Broadway there. So when I hear people who find their love of theater from Salt Lake City or from Texas or from Oklahoma. It's amazing because I think we forget in this area, like they're craving art, craving musical theater, living. Yeah. You know, I remember going to see my first Broadway show on a graduation trip from high school and it was 42nd Street. And it, and it starred everybody that was on the album. So Leroy Reams has since become a really dear friend of mine. To the fact that it was like that there was Leroy Reams up there and there was Tammy Grimes and on and on really profound for me. But to sit there, I remember right before the show started, I thought, what if it's just like Pioneer Theater, only it's in New York City? Like, what if instead of Salt Lake, it's just in New York and it's going to be, you know, and then the overture started and I started crying. And then the and then the curtain came up part way with all the feet tapping, uh, you know, and then before it raises up. And I'm crying even more. I'm like, it's different. It's different. <laughs> you know, it really. So that doesn't happen. How old are you when you graduate from high school? 17, 17. whatever, 18. Uh, that was that was really. It lived up to everything I wanted. You know, in that trip. And and then Barnum was the next night. And you know, I mean, I just think back. Like, I'm so jealous in a lot of ways. Of I always picture kind of people on the East Coast who grow up on the East Coast. I always think you guys are smarter. You're you're exposed to more things. There's just more exposure. Um, and I always just really admired it. So you're like, what was your first Broadway show? Mine? Well, I, you saw I, it. I, well, it's not that I don't it's not the most um highbrow Broadway Doesn't show. Matter. Ever, Doesn't but matter. It was the 
I was 12 years old. I was obsessed with Barbara Streisand. I, I was like a little gay boy from Jersey whose parents were not, I was obsessed with Manilow and Streisand. That was the levels of my life. <laughs> and my parents were not cool at all about it. They were, they were much cooler. I found Manilow because I asked for a karaoke machine and it came with like a demo cassette tape. And the first karaoke track was Mandy. And I heard it and said, this is the music I want to sing. And my parents were like, oh God, not, Man <laughs> not Manilow. <laughs> um, and you know they were listening to Led Zeppelin and and right right and fire and um and they took me to see Beauty and the Beast the first year it opened and then the, but what was good about my parents was yeah we saw Beauty and the Beast but the next show we saw was Moon Over Buffalo with Carol Burnett yeah. and, and Philip Bosco like it wasn't just yeah. the kids like the Disney yeah. like they took me to to that's everything great. that's and, so good amazing and now they're Moon stuck Over Buffalo I they, love it glitter cannonball that it came flying out, which is me. I love that, you know, you talked about being friends with Leroy Reams and I had this moment uh, the other day, the Broadway Podcast Network celebrating four years and they had an event to celebrate and Adam Pascal from Rent was there and Adam was like, Robert, I owe you. And I, as a kid, I was obsessed with Rent. Like as being, yeah. I was 13 yeah. in 1996, I remember it. Does it ever get old for you? Like you talk about Jerry Lewis, you talk about the friends you've made in this business, the jobs you've worked, the, the, like you're still at my heart and I'm sure you are too, that kid that loves this business. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, um, the most recent performance I did was um, we tried out the Merman show at Chelsea Table and Stage. That's what got this whole thing started. And, uh, and right there in that front horseshoe little ring there, was Karen Akers and Leroy. And Karen Akers is in my ears from Nine. From Pacific, I mean, she's also the Grand Hotel, but it, but the Nine album is one of my favorite. Her singing My Husband Makes Movies um, and Be On Your Own, that amazing, like, baritone, beautiful voice she has. And, I mean, I just sat, I just gave my goosebumps, I gave myself goosebumps right now, even imagining again, yeah. looking at Leroy and then two people over, is Karen. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that like Christine Ebersole is like a dear friend of mine. And you think, well, I have to separate that from her little Edie being one of the great award-winning performances against time, not against her year and the category, but like against history. And that's the best thing about being here is you are in and out of these people's lives with this. And even being as old as I am, you know, you start to realize like, Oh, I'm crossing past my one of my dear friends, Paula Lawrence, passed away in 2008, I think it was. And Paula had been in, she starred in something for the boys with Ethel Merman. So you're like, you're crossing paths with this person. She was the replacement, Mrs. Stray, Caution, Funny Girl, while, while, while Streisand was still there. You know, and you're just like, this is who you're having tea with and expressing an interest in. Um, and you're learning from this person, you know, they're, they're just your friend. They're a person in the world because you live in New York. And this is where this all kind of eventually percolates together. People find their way here because they're, you just find your way here. Cause this is, this, this is where people ended up, you know, it's certainly not the only place people are, but, um, but it's a fascinating, it's, it's fast. I never get, I ne it never gets old. It never Absolutely. gets old. Never. Well, if you want a quintessential New York City night, then you know that you need to head on this weekend. Go April 14th, Autumn in New York, Vernon Dukes, Broadway. The Clea Blackhurst box set coming to Chelsea Table and Stage every month. Uh, so you got to get your tickets. You can go to ChelseaTableAndStage.com and get your tickets. And you can go to CleaBlackhurst.com. If you're listening to us, it's her name.com. There Just it is. With a K. With a K. And all the info about you, if you want to... Uh, listen to your music and everything. All the links are on the website. So go, you know, it's such an honor because I look Thank up to you. people who do what you do so well. And I'm a fan and admirer of your work and your recording and everything. Thank and thank you for spending time with us and, yes. and giving us some insight. Absolutely, my play. I'm happy to be part of your like round table family now. Thank you. Yes, please. And we'll, we'll, we want you to come back and we want to talk more about Ethel Merman and Jerry Herman and all of it. Anytime. I'm here for you. Well, there you have it, folks. What a great chat. Clea Blackhurst. I, you got to love showbiz. Showbiz people are the best people. There's no business like show business. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm grateful you're here. If you want more information about me, follow me at Robert M. Bannon on Instagram. 
or go to robertmadden.com. And speaking of shows, you can see me at 54 Below, June 14th for the Robert Bannon Pride Playlist. It's my show where I take all the divas, diva anthems to celebrate Pride. It's a Friday night. Mauricio Martinez is my guest. And I promise you'll have a grand old time. We'll celebrate Pride together. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. There's more good than there is bad. There is more love than there is hate. Just go where the sun shines, y'all. The best is yet to come. Till next time, thanks so much for being here. I'll see you on the roundtable. Bye, everybody.